pleasure to introduce uh, Alyssa, who is a, a close to the end uh, PhD student at the University of Maryland. Um, she has a whole bunch of accomplishments, which are handwritten on a piece of paper that I accidentally left in my office. I'm going to have to wing and get a partial list of them. She was a visiting um, researcher at uh, the Max Planck University of Zurich, um, has a Facebook and NSF, and a National like a defense. Science Defense uh, Fellowship, and has distinguished paper awards from Unix and um, let's see, the John Carrot. The John Carrot. Uh, so lots of stuff, and that's only a partial list. And she's um, she's kindly joining us here today, squeezing us <laughs> in between various other commitments, uh, security for all, um, modeling structural inequities. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Um, and just as sort of context, this is my academic job talk, but feel free to kind of jump in with questions. And I also have some backup slides um, if you want more detail on, on certain things that may not be in here. Um, so basically, this talk is to, to begin talking about why you know, your grandfather struggles to make strong passwords, why you often click ignore when your device asks you to update, uh, and why your friend might have called you once or twice to tell you that they you know, accidentally sent money to a prince in a foreign country uh, and then realized that it was a scam. Uh, and in general, users have to make a variety of different security decisions. So they get confronted with warning messages, uh, they have to avoid phishing emails in their inboxes, and they have to make these increasingly strong passwords. Uh, and we as, as people are not always very good at making these decisions. And so despite the fact that security researchers have made a lot of advances on security problems, and there are a lot of security tools being released regularly, um, people's insecure decisions can still lead to a lot of risk. Uh, and so there was an issue recently around the WannaCry ransomware attack, where basically uh, this attack spread across the internet because in part, people had failed to update their devices. So there was a patch released that would have fixed the exploit used by the attack. Uh, and even months after that patch was released, people had not updated devices. And this wasn't just end users, it was also enterprises as well, like one of the British health systems. Uh, and so these insecure decisions, like not updating, can be very embarrassing for users when they get hacked. They're costly in terms of time. Uh, and they can also be quite costly financially. Um, so a researcher at CMU estimates that phishing causes between $61 million and $3 billion of losses uh, in the United States. And so as security researchers or practitioners, we're trying to keep people secure. Uh, and at a simplified level, in order to do that, we can either try to change the people to make them better at being secure, or we can try to change our systems in order to have those systems accommodate for people's insecure behavior. Uh, and I and other people in uh, the field of usable security argue that in order to do either of these things, we first need to understand why people are behaving insecurely in the first place. So if I have like my bicycle and I want to try to change it so that it goes faster, I would need to have some manual or blueprint for understanding how the bicycle works in order to figure out what I need to change. And so similarly, we want to have some manual to understand people's security decisions and then find the right levers uh, to address to try to make things more secure. Uh, and I do this development of a manual of understanding uh, using what I call behavioral security. So I combine uh, behavioral economic, kind of traditional security measurement analyses, and social scientific or HCI approaches uh, in order to try to build behavioral security models that can help us scientifically understand this insecure behavior and then change systems to help address it. Uh, and in my uh, prior work, I've built these behavioral security models in different security domains. Uh, and the reason that I like not to just focus on, say, authentication is because we want to look for systematic patterns across security domains where we can try to make uh, more generalizable changes. So I've looked at things like account and device security, so password reuse, software updating, uh, two-factor authentication, also spam and fake news, so how do people perceive or misperceive the truth? How do we design systems that can keep them away from false or malicious information. 
Uh, and then I've also looked at enterprise security. So we have people like software testers or developers who also have to make security relevant decisions. Uh, and they're human too, so they're not always perfect in their ability to do these things. Uh, and finally, this five looked at some privacy tangential topics like encryption and data use. So why don't people use encrypted messaging or why don't they use it properly? Uh, but before I talk about sort of what comes out of these models, it bears backing up to figure out whether people's security behavior is really appropriate for scientific study. So there's this old quote um, that the user is going to pick dancing pigs over security every time. Uh, and in fact, there was an Instagram plugin this past summer that had lots of videos of cute dancing animals. And if you used this thing, it actually stole your credentials. So this was kind of a literal uh, set of dancing pigs. And so the question is, is this sort of the right model of user security behavior? Uh, or can we tr try to find some better like, models of best fit for understanding why people do what they do? So in this talk, I'll uh, speak first about some experiments trying to test some different uh, economic models of security behavior. And then I'll talk about how uh, structural inequities, things like differences in socioeconomic status or internet skill, can influence security behavior, uh, and how modeling those inequities and then trying to balance them in systems can help people stay more secure and make sure no one gets left behind. Uh, and finally, I'll talk very briefly about some epistemology. So basically, when does one use these different sets of methods and how valued, or excuse me, how valid are uh, social science type methods in a security context? Uh, so to start out with the model of best fit. Um, so we have this, this quote about the dancing pigs. And then in 2009, Cormac had uh, this theoretical analysis that perhaps people are being rational when they ignore security advice because the cost of doing all of this security behavior would outweigh the benefits. Uh, and the argument wasn't that people are like sitting around with papers and pencils and computing what's rational, but maybe their behavior uh, is fitting this model. And so inspired by this, I wanted to see whether we could test uh, rationality models or rational choice models and see whether they fit uh, user behavior. And in order to do that, we need to be able to do some experimentation. So a lot of times in analysis of user security behavior, we do measurements. So we look at log data and we see how if people interacted with the system, we build a model based on those logs. Uh, and this is quite useful because we have good ecological validity. But even with A-B tests, there's a lot of factors that we can't control um, when we do measurement. And so as an alternative, people sometimes use surveys. They provide people with like a scenario, uh, and they say, how might you behave if this were to happen? But as some work that I had at uh, CCS shows, while security surveys are useful for many things, they're not great for doing controlled experiments. People don't have enough attention to necessarily pay attention to small uh, controlled variations. So we really want to be able to do experimentation to see how people make trade-offs in a security setting. And in order to do that experimentation, I built um, a behavioral economics style observational system. So basically, I wanted to generate something that looks like log data, but with a lot more control. And in this system, participants are going to create a simple bank account. Uh, and this account is going to hold their compensation for doing the study. And I'm going to set that compensation to something they're going to reasonably care about, like their hourly wage or twice their hourly wage. And just like the real world, this bank account is going to have a risk of being hacked. But I'm going to make that risk explicit. I'm going to tell you how likely it is that your study account is going to be hacked. And I want to see how you trade off that risk of being hacked against an option uh, to enable some security that will protect you. And so in this particular system that I'll talk about today, you can choose to enable two-factor authentication. And two-factor will reduce your risk of hacking, again explicitly. Uh, and it also increases the time it takes for you to complete the study. And one of the nice things about this artificial setting is that I can actually control within some window how long it takes for the code to get to you and whether it's the right code the first time so that I can try to control your costs. Yeah? Yeah? 
in your experiment, uh, based on your budget, uh, it, you have a limitation in terms of uh, the spectrum of uh, users that you can experiment. Yes, we're getting to so that in one second, the actually. The risk of uh, the price of their hourly pay, the hourly pay has a big spectrum. Yes, so I specifically used crowd workers who have a, uh, for two reasons. So one is they have a low hourly wage, um, but more importantly, uh, they earn money in small time increments. Uh, and the reason that that's important is that if I want to look at the cost from two-factor authentication, that has to be a relevant cost to the crowd worker. Um, and crowd workers earn money from doing tasks in like 10 seconds or 20 seconds, which maps very nicely to how long two-factor takes. So exactly. Um, and they're very uh, cognizant of their time. So they tend to switch tasks very easily, and they're really well attuned to that. Um, additionally, their hourly wage is about $5, which makes it feasible for doing experimentation. But absolutely, um, the, the experiment would not necessarily generalize to people with $200 hourly wages. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, OK, so to give a little bit more detail, participants will enter their crowd work ID, and then they'll create a password. Uh, and then they'll get some information about the study, similar to what I just told you. So they'll be told, this participant's told they're beginning the study with $5 in their account. And they have to log in once a day, otherwise they lose all of the money. This isn't hacking. This is to make sure that if they do two-factor, they'll have sufficient costs from doing it. Uh, I also did variations where they had to log in once a week. The results were quite similar. Um, so about 60% of crowd workers do this full time, so they're online quite regularly. Uh, and if they're hacked, they lose all of the money. And this person was told that studies indicate that 20% of users will have their accounts hacked over the course of the study. And I can do some experimental variation here. So I can vary the, hour, uh, the amount of money you're compensated with between this hourly wage and $10, which I ran some experiments with. And I can also test some traditional economic effects, like the endowment effect. So, uh, behavioral economists have, in offline behavior, shown that people care more about something they already have than something they're earning. So someone would care more about the $5 they start with than $1 and then earning $1 more every day, even though it's the same $5 at the end. Uh, and I can also, of course, vary the hacking percentage. And I didn't pick these hacking percentages based on like real-world statistics about account hacking. Uh, because A, there's not that many of them, and B, it's not clear how they would map to my weird scenario. But I actually looked at numeracy research, which studies how people interpret percentages to pick uh, values that they would be able to tell the difference between. Once they proceed past the screen, they have the option to enable two-factor authentication. And I used SMS-based two-factor not because it's the most secure, but because it's the easiest to control the time it takes uh, for someone to receive the code. Uh, the other thing is that mTurkers could have had some like privacy worries around giving the phone number. Um, but I, in a pilot study, I asked them like how often they got asked for their phone number in tasks. And almost all of the mTurkers said that they like gave their phone number out regularly. So they didn't really seem to care that much about giving one more person the phone number. And we did tell them in the consent form that we were storing it you know, in an encrypted place, and we'd get rid of it, and so forth. Um, so again, with regular people, that might be different. Yeah? So do you know if the workers understand what's two-factor authentication? Yes. So um, in a pre-study, we sampled a lot of these workers, and almost all of them had used it somewhere before and knew, even if they didn't know what it, why it was good, they knew what it was and what it would entail. Yeah. We did have an extra page like explaining it. Um, I used Duo two factor, so I had their explanation in case someone had a question. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm trying to understand this discussion. Yeah. I'm trying to say that that um, if you get hacked, then with probability 0.9, that hack will be nullified. Or Correct. are you trying to say that that it reduces your probability of being hacked to 10%? Mm, let's see. You had 20% risk of being hacked. If you do this, it reduces your probability to 2%. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Do you think the workers can 
Did you get to that two percent? Uh, that math? Yeah. So in the um, post survey, so I did a post survey after they did it to see if they roughly understood. Um, about seventy percent of them did understand like the math, and then the other thirty percent at least understood directionality-wise that it was helping them. Yeah. Turkers tend to be actually like relatively well educated, which helps for this um, math stuff. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I can also, of course, vary the hacking percentage between. 50% are a coin flip and 90%. Uh, the reason I didn't do 100% was that in a pilot we tried that and the trickers didn't believe us, so all of a sudden they thought that we were lying. Um, so these were the values we stuck with. Uh, those who chose to do two factor get a traditional SMS based text with a code. Uh, and they have to enter that every time they log in and they have to log in regularly to complete the study. Um, so in the experiments I'll talk about today, we did a kind of micro longitudinal study where we observed their behavior twice. Uh, so the first time I invited 150 of them to play one round of this game where they could earn up to $5 and they did this for five days. Uh, 125 of them finished, which means they filled out the questionnaire that tested the math skills and also had some questions about their demographics. Uh, unbeknownst to them, we then gave them a five day break. And after the five-day break, we invited the 125 who finished to play again. And they were told that we were going to be honest with them again, but they were going to be assigned to some new condition. And so they, you know, last time had no impact on this time. Uh, and 107 people finished both rounds of the study. Uh, and we didn't do a fully factorial design, so we didn't try every single combination, but we covered a range of uh, effective risk if you combine the hack and the protect percent, as well as variations in this endowment and earn. Um, and in some experiments I won't talk about with $10 as well. Unsurprisingly, only about half of the people decided to do two-factor authentication. And if you look at some uh, industry adoption statistics, this is in the range of what you would typically see. And so this takes us back to the question of whether or not people are making rational trade-offs um, with their costs and their benefits. So now we're going to do a little bit of math to see whether their decisions followed this, this rationality. Um, so cost of two-factor is the amount of time they spent just on the two-factor part of signing up and just on the two-factor parts of their logins times their estimated hourly wage. Uh, the expected value from two-factor is this dollar savings from the reduction in risk, uh, and it's rational if the expected value is greater than the cost. Um, so very briefly, if I have a participant who has a 20% chance of getting hacked, and they're protected, they have a two-factor that protects them half the time, uh, we'll imagine that it took them a minute to sign up for two-factor uh, and 180 seconds to do the two-factor parts of the sign-ins. Then if they have a 4.97 hourly wage, it costs them 33 cents in other MTurk tasks they weren't doing to do this two-factor. Uh, their expected value from two-factor is the 10% reduction in risk times the $5 they stand to earn, which is 50 cents. So this MTurker was rational because their expected value is greater than their cost. And what we see across all the Turkers is that the first time they do the game, 48% uh, of them are strictly rational, and they get a bit better at being rational once they've used the system uh, before. And one of the reasons we think that this is, is that they are starting to have a tighter uh, boundary for estimating how much their cost will be, how long it will take them to do this two-factor. Um, and in fact, when we look at modeling which of the Turkers were better at being rational, we see that those who have more internet skill, which is measured with like a validated sociology measure, and those who tend to do more other security behaviors were more rational. Um, again, I hypothesize this has to do with the more experience you have online, the more you've done two-factor, the better sense you have of how much it will cost you. Um, and again, Turkers are kind of hyper aware of time more so than other participants. Yeah? In your second round, did they keep the first round balancing the same account, or did they have like No, they had a totally new account, yeah. So I paid them out after the first one, yeah. Of the people who dropped out, did they have yes. the same ratio of, of enabling or not? Strangely, yes. Um, and we actually even had people who like forgot to log in regularly or who got hacked who came back to finish the questionnaire. Um, which was surprising to me. I thought that only the people who stood to earn money would come back, but some of the other ones did, yeah. Um, the other thing we saw was that 
people who were assigned to a higher risk condition were more likely to have behaved rationally. Uh, and that's not because they all did two-factor and it got more rational as there was more risk. Um, what we actually see is they spent longer on the page where they had to decide initially whether to do two-factor. Um, and this maps to some traditional like behavioral economics literature, which has shown that people who are in more resource-constrained settings, like poorer people um, or who are at more risk, behave more rationally. Um, perhaps this resource constraint um, gives them some more impetus to, to think harder about things. So anyway, in our case, uh, those who had higher risk spent longer trying to make the decision. Uh, so some of them were rational, but we didn't feel like that fully explained why only half of them were doing two-factor. Uh, and so the question then is, you know, are these users boundedly rational? Can we come up with like a small set of biases that are skewing their cost-benefit trade-off? Or are they paying attention to dancing pigs? Or are they just like flipping coins? in order to decide whether or not to do security. So to test this bounded rationality argument, we're going to try to predict whether or not someone enabled two-factor authentication. And we can predict this in the first round as a function of account value. So in this case, the endowment or earn condition, which behaves very similarly to the $5, $10 situation, uh, and as a factor of the risks that we showed them, how likely your account was to be hacked, how much you got protection. And we're also going to add some controls. So the first one is password strength. Um, I didn't tell them that how strong their password was would have any effect on their risk, but they might have perceived it to be related. Uh, it could also be that people who make stronger passwords are more likely to do two-factor. We want to control for these things. Um, and we measure this with an existing password meter. Uh, we also want to control for internet and like security expertise or skill using some pre-existing measures. Uh, and we'll control for demographics. In the model of the first uh, round behavior, these controls were not significant. Uh, and in general, we had variations in password strength, but there's not enormous variations in demographics um, or skills with trickers, for example. Uh, all right, so the first thing we see is that uh, we have a replication of the endowment effect. So in this online security setting, if we build a logistic regression model to predict whether or not you enable two-factor, those who are in the endowment condition where they started with $5 instead of having a dollar and earning more were twice as likely to enable two-factor authentication. And that's something we'd expect to see in other offline scenarios, so they seem to care more about protecting um, the money they already have. And this chart at the bottom just shows the logistic regression results. Yeah? Related to that, is that because uh, for the people who didn't call the endowment, they never really earned $5 on that day, so at the end of their balance is much less than 25 uh, yes, so they, if they don't log in, so for both conditions, if they don't log in every day, they don't get paid, they don't get any money. So you couldn't like have a dollar and then not log in till the last day and still get the dollar, you would be, right. still get zero dollars. Um, but certainly your risk in terms of losses is different. Like on, if you get hacked on day three, you lost three dollars and you get zero dollars at the end versus if you get hacked on day three in the endowment condition, you lost five dollars, although in both cases, you're still going to earn zero dollars or stand to earn five dollars. So yeah, $5. always five dollars. Yeah. No, 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 five dollars total. Yeah, yes, yes. Yes, so um, the reason for that is that the experiment took the Turkers on average, like across five days, it took them 20 minutes to do it. Um, and on MTurk, they would have earned like $1.50 for spending 20 minutes. So $5 was actually a lot more than they'd get normally. Yeah. Yeah. So when do you inform the workers that they've been hacked? At the end? Uh, yes, at the end. Yeah, always at the end. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Um, yeah. Um, were they able to enable the two factor off? like, let's say, halfway through? No, the... only at the beginning. Yeah, partially to test this effect, exactly. And, and, yeah. And there was no hint to them that this study was about something other than the original password you gave them. Like, they, they didn't know that, there, that you were studying security. No, no, we told them, like, oh, we're building a new bank system, and we want you to test it out and try using it. Yeah, exactly. Um, that said, by the time they do the second round, they may have figured out, because there's this hacking phenomena, that it was about security. Um, but we didn't tell them that, yeah, exactly. Okay, um, yeah, so the other thing we see is that 
Uh, if you're placed in a condition with more risk of being hacked, you're more likely to enable. That's good. That seems reasonable. Uh, also, if we tell you that two-factor is more protective, you're also more likely to enable. So both of these are reasonable directions. Uh, and we have some interaction effects where if you're in the endowment condition and we give you more protection from two-factor, you're even more likely to enable. Uh, but our ultimate question was not necessarily just about whether the factors are significant, but how well do they describe the behavior we're observing. Um, and so what we see is that this model with these factors explains 16% of the variance in behavior. Uh, and a good psychology model would explain around 30% uh, or 40%. So we're doing OK, uh, but not nearly as well as we would like to do if we're going to base things on these behavioral models. And so the question is, if we go to round two and we add some additional data, can we get better at predicting um, their behavior? So we're going to add two things. The first is costs. So we're going to use the time it took them uh, to log into and sign up for the system as a proxy for their cost from doing two factors. So it turns out that the time it takes you to use the system generally is highly correlated with how long it took you to do two factor. Uh, and this, despite the fact that I used like an existing enterprise usable two factor, there's quite a range in how long it was taking different participants uh, to log in with this system. Um, and that was actually correlated to their socioeconomic status and their internet skill. Yes, question. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I, yeah. So it's known that workers um, will often uh, do multiple tasks at the same time. Yeah. So is that what's going on? Uh, no, so this was actually like the tab focus time. Um, so as far as we can tell, they were not task switching. Yeah. Uh, yes, OK. Um, and then the other thing we're going to add is their past behavior. So we know what they did in the first round. Let's see if they're anchoring to what they usually do. Um, and we have some control of this in the, the measure about security skill, but we want to see about anchoring in this task. And what we see when we, uh, the controls also weren't significant here, aside from the socioeconomics costs uh, covariance. So what we see is that uh, those, if we just include your risk and your account value, we have a model that explain nine, explains 9% 9 of your variance. So something, but not terrific. Once we add the cost, the difference in uh, cost to log into the system, we're able to explain 26% of the variance in the behavior. So this is pretty close to what you'll see in a typical psychology model of like why people pick products in a grocery store. Once we add past behavior with these <laughs> other factors, we're explaining 61% of the variance. So that's a pretty high proportion of variance for a human. Um, it's a very controlled system, so we're not necessarily saying that that will generalize to an industry setting, but uh, it shows us the strong influence of costs and also past behavior. Um, what this doesn't mean with the past behavior is that people always did the same thing. So if we put them in a really, uh, in like a medium risk setting the first time, they make their choice. If we then put them in a super low risk setting the next time, they will switch to not using two factor and vice versa. But they have a strong preference for sticking to their typical behavior. Uh, and so when you're designing a system, this then raises some questions about given some users with some set of priors in terms of what they want to do, how do I approach nudging them out of it? And how do I think about a person who's never used two-factor before versus someone who's been asked to do it a lot and never has or who usually does it? Um, and similarly with costs, we then need to think about whether certain users maybe should get YubiKeys or some extra help so that they're not sort of unfairly investing a lot more for the same security return. Yes? Is the hydro people enough to deduce the statistical significance? Yes. So in this case, yes, because we have um, a relatively small number of features. Um, and the effects, therefore, have strong power. Um, if we had more people, then we might see some effects from those controls, for example. But I think they were too weak for, for that size signal. Um, so this uh, experiment is somewhat of an example of how behavioral security can help us go beyond uh, sort of traditional factors we think about, which is, will this behavior increase your security? Is there a risk to the user account? Those things don't necessarily explain terribly well why people are choosing to do um, behaviors. But once you factor in the person's own abilities, their capacity for cost, how much they value their account, uh, and how they typically behave, we get a lot closer um, to explaining their behavior. 
and in future work I'll mention briefly uh, how we can try to build in these kind of models to uh, optimization problems where we're trying to allocate a security budget and see which users should get uh, which security requirements or extra help. So one of the things we saw here, right, was this difference between users in terms of their costs for doing two-factor. And it turns out that that kind of inequity between users is true not just in two-factor, but in a lot of these different domains. Uh, and these inequities are based not just on skills, um, but they're also related to socioeconomic status uh, and at times to culture. So things like whether I'm a user in a highly internet penetrated country, whether or not my country or my culture is very collectivistic, so I may have different threat models in terms of who's attacking my account. And that can change how well uh, security protections work for me or how I reason about whether or not I would want to do some behavior. Uh, and so I'd like to give one case study of how these inequities can pop up um, in spam susceptibility and then how we uh, think about trying to balance them out in a system. Uh, so there's a lot of prior work on email spam, why do people fall for email spam, a little bit of work on Twitter spam, relatively little work on why people fall for spam on Facebook. Uh, so that's what I will talk about here. Um, this project was a collaboration with Facebook and is a more traditional kind of security measurement. So using log data to look at why people are falling for spam. And uh, I had two research questions I was particularly interested um, in looking at spam susceptibility. So the first was that work on email spam has proposed some uh, inequities in terms of gender, age, and also skill uh, as far as who falls for um, spam in their email. But these factors hadn't been quantified very much uh, and also hadn't been quantified in context of other factors that are more traditional for spam, like who's sending the content and so on and so forth. Uh, the second thing is that social spam allows us to look a little bit more at social influence. Um, so on Facebook, uh, outside of the US in particular, people's networks of who's sharing content are typically very country-centric. So mostly it's other people in your country who are part of your network. And so as a first cut of looking at this sort of network influence, um, I wanted to see whether having other people in the country who are sharing spam or clicking on it or so forth had any influence on whether you yourself were going to do this. Uh, and this was driven in part by prior work that had shown that if you tell people like 10 other people have done two-factor authentication, they're more likely to do it too. That's encouraging a good behavior. Can we also encourage bad behaviors in the same way? So in order to answer those questions, um, we're going to analyze about 600,000 records of user content interactions. So half of these are interactions with spam, so they're viewer content pairs. So I have some viewer, some piece of content that is known to be spam, and whether or not that viewer clicked on that spam. And these are sampled over uh, the majority of a month because there's different patterns in the spam by day of week and so forth. So what exactly do you mean by spam? Yes. Uh, so Facebook spam is um, anything that tries to gain uh, illegitimate financial gains, so phishing, uh, distributes malware, hijacks accounts. The most interesting one is this last one, which is it fails to deliver on a promise outcome. So what that means is if you see a preview in your news feed for an article about kale and you click on it and you get an ad farm, that fails to deliver on a promised outcome. However, if you click on it and you get three sentences about kale and a bunch of ads, that does not fail to deliver on a promised outcome. So they have a very narrow definition of, of failing to deliver. Um, yeah, so the way that Facebook detects spam um, is they have classifiers detecting as the spammers write the spam, so most of it gets caught then. And then some of it makes it onto the news feed. They have more classifiers running. They also have humans, like users, reporting things. Uh, and then they flag something as spam. In this data set, we have everything that was flagged as spam, and then we had human uh, labelers re-go over it to make sure it was actually spam. Yeah. Um, and then the other half of the data set, oh, and, and specifically we looked only at spam that contained the URL. You also have spam on Facebook trying to get people to call phone numbers, but I have no way to know if they did that. Um, the other half of the data set is what I would call ham, so this is explicitly non-spam. And the reason for that is if I just model why people click on spam, I have no way of knowing that it's why they click on spam and not why they click on Facebook stuff. Um, so I want to be able to compare why you click on Facebook stuff with why you click on spam in particular. 
All right, so we're going to have some sets of features to try to investigate these problems of inequity. So we'll have demographics of age and gender. Uh, we also have a proxy for uh, skill, which is your activity level on Facebook, um, which is measured as the number of days out of the last 28 you were active. Uh, and the reason it doesn't have to do with time spent or what you were doing is because different countries have super different norms about what people do on Facebook. And this is kind of the most general metric for activity that they have been able to find. Uh, we're also going to have some country attributes. So how prevalent is spam in your country? as well as clicking norms. So what's the ratio of clicking on spam to clicking on ham or regular content? And it turns out that in some countries, that ratio is greater than one, because for various cultural reasons, people uh, click on spam very often, um, or click on ad farms for various different reasons. And finally, we're going to have more traditional spam factors, like your relationship to the content uh, and whether the content was reshared. Um, I won't talk about those today, but wanted to put them up here because they're in the model. Um, and so you need to know that. All right, uh, so we're going to feed these features into our classifier, and we're going to predict whether or not you clicked on some content. We're going to build one classifier for spam and one for ham so that we can compare the features. And we find that the area under the curve for spam is 0.72, and for ham is 0.8. Uh, and both of these metrics are significantly higher then the same metrics for the classifiers that actually run to identify the spam on Facebook. And so we went ahead with these um, because the logistic regression gives us nice explainability. Um, we also tried this with like more fancy classifiers and were able to improve the accuracy for when they actually want to predict like high-risk users. OK, so one of the first things we found is that women are more likely to click on spam. And this had been mentioned in prior email spam work as well. Uh, but we saw a, a quantified effect, which was that women were 19% more likely to click on spam. We thought that was maybe more interesting than some of the other research questions to try to figure out why that was. And so in order to figure out why that was, um, we first took a look at what kinds of spam people were seeing. So what we did was we took a, yeah, yeah, yeah. Are women in 1940 likely to click on ham? Yes, they are. Um, not true of older people. Older people are more likely to click on anything, um, but no difference with spam. Yeah. Um, yes, so we took a random sample of 250 pieces of spam and created a code book of the types of spam that we were seeing. And then we took another sa random sample, coded uh, independently the spam into those code books, and then estimated the prevalence of these types of spam in our sample. Uh, and what we see is that we have essentially three types of spam. The first is shopping spam, so something trying to get you to buy any kind of product. The second is media spam, so that's videos. And most of those are adult content or graphic content videos. Um, and finally, we have interactives, which are like games. And it turns out that if we look at the click-through rate for anyone, across anyone, for shopping and media spam, shopping spam is twice as effective as media spam. And even when we actually pulled in these samples, we had initially thought we ran the query wrong. Because it's pretty clear that like adult videos and graphic videos, like beheadings, are not supposed to be on Facebook. On the other hand, the shopping spam looked really similar to regular ads. And so we thought that maybe we got ads in our data set. The spammers are just very good at the shopping spam. Uh, and so it turns out that women see the vast majority of the shopping spam, and men see the vast majority of the media spam. And we also checked differences in internet skill between men and women. And we didn't find any significant difference. And that's true in other literature on differences in skill on Facebook. Uh, and so what it looks like is that women actually are being given a harder job of detecting this more effective spam than men are. Um, and that's due to a bunch of factors in the newsfeed algorithm that thinks they'll be more interested in this kind of spam and therefore feeds it to them. Uh, and on the other hand, it's pretty easy to tell if you've been on Facebook for a little while what kind of videos should and shouldn't be there. All right. Uh, the other thing that we found interesting um, was some country effects. So people who are in countries with a high prevalence of spam were less likely to click on spam. And we hypothesized that this had, there we go. This is further support um, that having experience with the Facebook system and what kind of content should be there is important. 
And actually, when we look at activity level on Facebook, that's also significant. So the more you're on Facebook, the better you know the content that's supposed to be there, the less you're clicking on spam. Uh, and this is true not just for end users. In some work I've done with software testers, uh, we see that they're better at detecting vulnerabilities when they have more experience with the system. Um, and it's actually a significant leg up they have on, say, white hats who are coming in from the outside. So system experience may be a special type of security skill. On the other hand, if you're in a country with a high proportion of clicking on spam, you're more likely to click. Uh, so as an example, if I have five users in this study um, who are from Iceland, they were tending to follow the clicking norms of the other 300,000 people from Iceland, which is fairly interesting um, and not something we necessarily expected. Um, and with spam, we hypothesize that this may be because social norms are providing a feedback loop on insecure behavior. So in the US, where there's a very low ratio of spam clicking, if I click on spam or reshare it, it's quite likely that someone's going to kind of embarrass me about it or tell me that I should take this down or report it or whatever. In a country where that's not true, people may even like the content, click on it, give me sort of positive feedback for having done this. And so I have the opposite type of feedback loop that's now encouraging an insecure behavior. And this fed into one of our first uh, system change suggestions which was that in a targeted way, in particular regions or networks where there is a lot of clicking on spam, we may want to surface the number of friends who've reported a piece of content as sort of a negative counterpiece, as opposed to just the number who've liked a piece of content or clicked on it. Uh, and you've seen Facebook doing this a little bit more recently with fake news. Uh, the other thing is that we have this issue around the shopping spam, right? And one of the problems is that the shopping spam looks a lot like real Facebook ads. So we could try to put authenticity indicators on the ads, um, but one of the problems with that is spammers could just try to spoof these authenticity indicators, right? And so the other thing that uh, we wanted to try to do was to use NLP or like very basic um, other kinds of machine learning in order to identify things that were promotions that hadn't gone through an official ads pipeline. So if this thing looked like a promotion, but it didn't go through an official pipeline, then it should be flagged for review or at least downranked um, to get it further out of people's news feeds. But, but yeah. Is, is the difference between shopping spam and ads then just that Facebook is getting paid for one and not the other? Uh, no. So the, the shopping spam usually actually steals credentials. You never get the product. Um, it's not really selling anything. It's sort of like the Viagra emails. Um, yeah. Yeah, so if you, sometimes they will send it to you. Yes, many of them. I th Yeah, from Savage's work, they almost always sent it then, although I want to say I saw an updated paper. But it's should not be, it's like it's prescription stuff that should not be sold in a non-prescription way. Wait, yes. Um, this often, now they're having like the, the Ray-Ban ones that you'll sometimes get, the product will never show up. Um, or once they actually click on the link, it will take them to like a, a drive-by malware download. Yeah. Yes. Um, because you can actually, so one of the, the special issues for women is that they have a lot of um, multi-level marketers in their news feeds, and that's actually allowed on Facebook. You can do non-ad promotion of those things, and that's not considered spam. Um, yeah. And then the final thing is we can make some changes to classification. Um, so at the time that, that this project was done, Facebook was not using click-through rates as a feature or as any kind of feedback in spam classification. So they were very focused on getting spam out of the newsfeed, like away from eyeballs. But arguably, spam that you see that you don't click on is a lot less dangerous than spam that you click on. Um, and so the suggestion is to start prioritizing advances in classification for this high click-through rate spam and keeping track of new high click-through rate content that's popping up. Uh, the second thing is that we may need to start having separate classifiers or classifiers that take into account the type of spam, uh, as opposed to just looking for black hole links and other sort of less nuanced spam factors. Uh, so I worked with Facebook on implementing multiple of these changes, but they don't let me tell you which ones uh, or what happened after <laughs> I implemented them with them. All right, um, so I talked about these uh, economic and then measurement approaches. The last approach that I typically use uh, is more social scientific. Um, and these social scientific approaches are helpful for looking at more 
broad question. So uh, outside of, say, just two-factor or just Facebook spam. Uh, and during my PhD, I received a grant of um, survey data that I've used to do a lot of this analysis. Uh, and this survey data asked questions about uh, general security and privacy behaviors and experiences. Uh, and it was conducted using a probabilistic random digit dial, which is the gold standard for doing surveys aside from doing a census sample. And basically what this uh, methodology allows you to do is uh, the company will take a mailing list of all the people in the United States. It will link those to landline and mobile phone numbers. It will look at which types of people are undercovered. It will actually go visit them and give them a telephone and phone access so that they can be sampled. And then they'll do their random sampled survey. And this allows them to have nearly a non-zero chance of talking to anyone in your given sample you care about, like the United States. And then once you see the proportions of types of people who've responded, you can compute a confidence interval for how well the responses should represent the whole population. Uh, so essentially, this particular data set that I received was weighted to generalize within 2.7% of the opinions of people in the United States, uh, with a bit of variation in confidence interval by specific subtype. And I used this to look at a bunch of different inequities in terms of uh, where people get advice about security, numbers of incidents experienced, and so forth. Uh, but the one I want to talk about very briefly um, is that inequities may be able to be inherited. So in this survey, uh, we asked people about their privacy behaviors. So things like whether they block cookies, um, whether they use private browsing, so on and so forth. Uh, and for those who are parents, we asked them how important they believed privacy was for their children. And then we asked them a battery of questions about whether they helped their children with various types of privacy things. So like, did you help them set their privacy settings? Did you talk to them about posting online? Did you talk to them about cookies? So on and so forth. And what we see when we look at two parents who have the same behaviors and who put the same amount of importance on privacy is that the parent who has a higher income between two different households is 66 port 66% more likely to have reported helping their child with a variety of privacy behaviors. Uh, so if we look at this in a chart, we have the proportion of the US population on Y and income buckets on X, and the light blue are the ones who reported that they helped their child with a variety of these behaviors. And as income goes up, the proportion who have reported helping their children also goes up. Uh, and so this is quite concerning because we're typically assuming that young children are sort of digital natives and they're coming into adulthood with all of these digital skills. Uh, but if some of the children are getting different digital skills at home than others, we have some policy questions around doing privacy education in schools and where that education is supposed to fall. Uh, and this difference becomes more pronounced if we look at education. So parents who have at least some college education are three times as likely to help their children as other parents. Um, and there's a number of like structural factors, like working multiple jobs and various other things that can factor into this. All right. Um, so uh, we used a variety of different methods, uh, which raises the last question, which is when do you use which of these methods? Uh, and the answer is certainly not when Facebook decides to collaborate or when you get a grant of data. Right? We want to be a bit more, a bit more scientific than that. And so recently, uh, I've done some work comparing uh, when you would want to use, say, uh, log data versus survey data um, to answer different questions. So uh, specifically, I had host records of how people had responded to update prompts, so being uh, prompted by various applications to do a software update. I can try to model from that log data why you chose to update which application. Did it mention security in the update message? Had you had negative experiences, et cetera, et cetera? Uh, or I could do a survey where I present those messages to you and I ask very similar questions and generate a model. And so this paper looks at when, uh, which approach is more or less relevant and where, uh, what kinds of research questions are valid to answer. Uh, secondly, we have different kinds of samples we can use. So the first study I mentioned uh, used Amazon Mechanical Turk. Uh, a lot of researchers also use uh, web panels, which are sort of convenient samples of users that have 
demographics that match those of the US, for example, but aren't sampled in this very uh, intensive probabilistic way. And so we want to know how well uh, do the results from these samples match those that come from these probabilistic approaches. Uh, and that's something I'll be presenting at Oakland uh, in a couple of months. And finally, uh, for the, the first behavioral economics thing that I mentioned, I'll be releasing this uh, eventually as an open source platform where other researchers are able to do different kinds of experiments, uh, also beyond two-factor authentication, but with things like updating uh, pretend games that are in the system as well. All right, uh, so future work. What's next? The first thing um, is doing more behavioral security systems. So a lot of my work thus far was building models to understand what was going on and making some point changes to systems like the Facebook spam system. Uh, but the question is whether we can bake these models into more uh, kind of theoretical approaches to trying to fix things. And so the first approach in that direction is to use um, mechanism design, so some game theoretic techniques, to model uh, the different kinds of levers that a company has in order to increase security, which includes some uh, things like two-factor and user controls, and see whether feeding in a behavioral model of how this user actor will behave can help us do some optimization in terms of when should I prompt which users. So maybe I have a user who just made a new account. I'm usually prompting them then and there to do two-factor, but they might not value the account yet. So maybe I should sustain that risk for six months and then prompt them once they have gained some account value. Uh, I can also think about distributing resources, so perhaps giving a YubiKey uh, or some other kind of resource to my users who have really high costs or really high risks in order to increase the likelihood that they will go ahead and enable security and in order to maximize my own profit. The second thing is that we talked a bit about uh, security skills. And one of the things that happens now is that if I have users who are new to coming online, they're dumped into a very evolved security ecosystem. So most of us kind of lived through various different password policies that kept iterating. That's not true if I just go online now or I'm a little kid. Um, and so we uh, want to think about how we can effectively teach people those minimum sets of skills. Uh, and one technique that may be able to be used is, is machine teaching. Um, and machine teaching has been used for things like how do I teach someone long division by giving them a properly ordered and minimal set of flashcards. Uh, and so the question is, could we give uh, our algorithm a goal state of this strong password and have it learn an inverse function of examples that it would have had to see um, in order to learn to create this strong password? Uh, and if it can learn these sets of examples, can we see whether using those as sort of intermediary steps for a user can help them gain uh, some set of security skills? The next thing uh, is to go beyond security. So in some work that I have done recently, when we ask people to report to us over time experiences of threat um, or safety they've had online, they talk about some things that fall into a classical security bucket some that fall into privacy, some that are sort of on the boundary, and some things that are more related to offline criminology. Um, so if I have had someone who threatened me in person, and all of a sudden they pop up in my Twitter feed or they friend request me, that's now an online problem as well, not just an offline problem. Uh, and so recently, uh, while I've been in Switzerland, I've been uh, doing work with sex workers to understand their security and privacy experiences and the intersection of their behaviors with offline threats of violence um, and stalking and so forth. And these kinds of questions are relevant also to gig workers. So there's an increasing number of women using apps to find uh, domestic work jobs. And then there are certain issues that can come from going into a household um, and maybe not having enough heuristics to determine if it's safe. And this is now a computer-mediated issue as well. Uh, finally, I am interested in uh, trying to help practitioners be able to make more rational decisions. Um, and practitioners have sort of a hard job because we often don't really measure for them what the harms are from people having these sorts of attacks or what their preferences are in terms of what will happen to them. And so we're asking 
uh, practitioners and users to make trade-offs under a lot of uncertainty, right? Like you rarely get the information that the account has some X percent chance of getting hacked. Uh, and so in this work, um, I'm thinking of a number of different ways specifically to quantify uh, some of the impact of over-personalization. Um, and so one small project, uh, which would uh, be a collaboration uh, with Facebook eventually, is to look at how personalization of job ads affects income uh, over time. So basically, uh, Facebook and other companies have platforms. The Facebook specifically is building a platform for blue-collar workers um, where they want to have them apply for jobs through the platform, and they'll advertise jobs to them. Uh, and the question is, if you're an electrician, and I so personalize your ads that you only get ads for electrician jobs, versus I give you ads for electrician, master electrician, and some educational programs, or I add some noise and you're suddenly getting culinary ads and plumbing ads, how does that impact both your own perception of your opportunity space as well as your income or where you apply over time? Can I cons am I constraining you by over-personalizing? And if I am, can I show that there's some harm there? Uh, and there's other ways we can look at this, um, including looking at you know, if we add a lot of noise to the ads or we confuse uh, the profile that an advertiser has about you, how does that affect how good the ads are that they give you in terms of your own approval and in terms of how well they value you as a user? Uh, the second thing is that we can use people's preferences uh, or try to model people's preferences around revealing information about themselves to learn uh, more efficient boundaries for doing things like differential privacy. So for example, uh, is there some noise threshold at which people are willing to share certain types of information, but at which they're not willing to share others? And can we use some traditional kind of behavioral economics information revealing games to figure out where those boundaries are? Uh, so in summary, I blend uh, multiple methodologies to try to model why people don't behave securely uh, and especially to look at marginalized groups, people who have uh, low socioeconomic status or other types of uh, factors that can create inequities. Uh, I identified some of the, the early evidence of security inequities, which have led to um, policy discussions around security education, not just for children, also for adults, uh, as well as discussions around kind of the boundaries and defining uh, what it means to do work on security. Uh, finally, I've worked on uh, changes for not just spam systems, but also suspicious login and two-factor authentication design, uh, mostly at Facebook, but also some at Dropbox. Uh, and finally, I've used these modeling approaches of human preference uh, beyond security and also in contexts uh, like machine learning fairness, where we may want to model a user's perception of the fairness of features and then constrain our search for an accurate classifier based on meeting some constraints of perceived feature fairness. Thank you. Happy to take questions. I think I'll sit. Yeah. Yeah. So they actually did implement things. Um, and anecdotally, because I'm not able to say concretely, um, some of them did reduce click-through rates on spam. Um, so they were effective. Uh, one of the ones that I'm hoping to be able to actually report on um, is some work on suspicious login notifications. So uh, I did some work looking at how people interpret those notifications. And one of the problems is that on the, the back end, we have some prediction that this is a suspicious login. Um, and notifications get popped up at a range of classifier confidence levels. So if I'm someone who gets a ton of these messages when the confidence is 60%, and it's usually because I'm VPNing, I have no way of knowing that I just got a notification for something at 90%. And so I just ignore that as sort of a false positive, even though it isn't necessarily. So that's something that they are. Uh, changing the UI design for and may be willing to actually openly report on the, the efficacy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, you talked about the, uh, the discussion um, of uh, parents with their children. Yeah. Uh, and uh, this, uh, well, I've had discussions with my children. <laughs> uh, and both are actually computer science majors in okay. college uh, at UMass. And um, they uh, don't really listen. Yeah. So I wonder, you know, there's, you know, there's maybe some 
uh, more sophisticated users who are saying uh, to their children, um, you should be using strong passwords, and my kids <laughs> refuse to, to use To listen to you, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 You could tell them to use weak passwords. <laughs> 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 that would be a fun study. Yeah, so absolutely a limitation of that work is I don't know what's actually happening on the kids' side, both in terms of are they listening, but also in terms of for the kind of less resourced children, are they getting this advice from like somewhere else that wasn't measured in the study? Um, the other thing to your point is actually one thing I've studied is whether um, people with like security backgrounds or CS degrees are any better at this stuff, and the answer is most definitely no. Um, so that's uh, also something that kind of always comes up, is just because you're an expert does not mean you're more protected. Whether or not you should be, we could, we could debate, but yeah. A confidence is definitely, yes, exactly. It, it, you know exactly enough to be very dangerous, yes, precisely. Do you see any impact on the complexity make enabling to factor off a very tedious process mm -hmm. uh, or you provide a very long description and people don't read description yeah. or manual on it. Yes. Like from the product group that's now an issue we face on a daily basis. People yes. Don't read. Yeah. Uh, so do you see an impact uh, because for example sometimes say well secure by default right you must include mm -hmm. to factor off otherwise you won't be able to register. Yes. So do you see an impact while well, people don't register yeah. at all and they just drop Yes. Um, yeah, so two things. There are definitely message length, like when modeling updating response, we see a big effect from that. And I would, I would lump that in in some ways with costs, right? So like my literacy level will have some impact on that, but also just like what else I'm doing and how long it literally takes me to read the text is an increase in cost. Um, in terms of the requirements thing, yeah, so in the, the paper about two-factor, we had this uh, very hand-wavy. Um, market analysis about like, okay, so why don't we just require the two-factor and then it's all going to be good. Um, and what we did, and I, I caveat that this is like theoretically hand wavy, but basically if we have some users with some frequency of login, they have some values to their accounts. Um, if you required 2FA, presumably given some rate of hacking, you would have some pretty significant losses in terms of user time because they're doing a bunch of security they don't need to do. Um, Granted, in like a regular system that's not mTurk, you may not care so much about user time, uh, but you care about engagement loss. And so that's definitely something that I've seen. And actually, um, when I went to Facebook, one of the things that we discussed was even what they do is they don't put two-factor in even the top three suggestions because of reduction in numbers of logins, so reduction in engagement, as well as the cost of sending those SMS two-factor messages, which are accounted for in this sort of hand the analysis. Um, and so usually we would sort of not advocate for the requirement, both because it's costly to you, right, in terms of engagement, but also because you can end up on a rough line of like paternalism in terms of, you know, does the user have a right to choose how much they value the account that you are protecting? Um, and so banks are now starting to require two-factor, I think, in part under the, uh, A, under the assumption that you're going to value that account, but B, if the policy is that every bank has to do two-factor, then no one's going to leave your bank because of that, versus for you guys, they very well might. Um, and, you know, it's possible that your product isn't their most valued one, so they don't want two-factor on it. Yeah. You, you mentioned on, on, on uptake, you said that you used like 52 or 48 percent account number uptake on that. 52. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I, did, do I remember correctly you were saying that that, that was um, somehow reflective of you know, norms across the industry? Because my impression was when given a choice, it's very significant. Hello. Maybe I'm most familiar with There is a rate. very wide range I've seen um, from industry reports anywhere between 30 and like 65%. So I'd say we're on the so higher. We're always talking about SMS as a factor, not, you know, the. the not the other. Factor. Yes, always SMS for those. but. That said, I've gotten that from like white paper reports that usually have very little data. 35 to? 265 was what I I've seen. Thought, I would have thought 35 would be an upper bound. Upper bound. Than a lower at least from what they're reporting. That said, the honesty of that reporting, I cannot necessarily comment on. Yeah. It really depends on your account size, right? Mm. Like uh, my bank right. account uh, of all my money is certainly more valuable I, I still than, still think 30, than credit card company, sure. right? Because it's very, very the bad charger, I can just uh, ask them to wave it. Yeah, right? yeah. I, I don't put the two-factor on my credit card. 
log in, but who took a cipher on that? <laughs> well, actually, the protection of the bank account is inconsistent with the credit card. The bank is the bank. No. But, but, but I think 35% is still way higher than the uptake even at banks. I think it's, I think it's low. Hmm. Okay, I, does the does bank the ever, ever report their transactions? The, one, the, the white papers I've seen are usually from the two-factor vendors who obviously have some incentive to like <laughs> do some doctoring to those numbers. So I wouldn't be surprised if, it's, um, if it is lower. That's just what I've seen kind of publicly. Um, I've never seen a bank report. Yeah, banks tend yeah. to report things that they're not. Yeah, I'm trying to remember. Them. Yeah, I don't I remember. remember yeah. something from PayPal several years ago okay. where they made YubiKeys um, you could have this for free, and I believe it was sub 1%. That afterwards. wanted the, yeah. the YubiKey, yeah. Yeah, YubiKeys are interesting. Like, I mentioned them as a resource here, but they may or may not be even a good resource because there's some literature that they're really hard to set up, and then people worry about losing them, and yeah, so I think, yeah. yeah. People should understand passwords, but they're fine. <laughs> Don't yeah. let me come over there. <laughs> That's, a, I mean, I, to, to your point, I think that the mTurkers in general are more internet savvy and do more security behaviors, so um, their uptake will be, will be higher, and also they had like much stronger incentives to care, I think, than so. Yeah. Think yeah. I think something that um, struck me as counterintuitive, uh, they said yeah. that people who are resources trained act more rationally. Yes. Yeah. As opposed to, you know, doing a lot of math. So, yeah. What's going on? Um, yeah, so this is the, um, I'm going to pronounce his name wrong, but Traversky and Kahneman, a lot of their experiments. Um, and basically, what they felt was going on yeah. um, wasn't that they were doing math, but that they were um, much better at estimating. Um, their various resources or costs. So like if you asked a high resource user to estimate how much they would spend on vacation, their estimate would be much further off than someone who has very little money to spend. That was their um, finding. Yeah, I, okay, so I think I see what's going on here. I, I think I maybe misunderstood what you meant by resource mm. I think what, in your example, it's like, you know, the global resources that have at hand. I thought you meant the resources available to me to make this decision. Ah, uh, no, just in general. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yes, uh, yes. Right, okay. Yes, yes, yes. Sorry about that. Yeah. So, nice. uh, I have a question. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, you, uh, you mentioned, you know, some paper that's going to come out at Oakland. Uh, yes. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that one was actually at CCS about the surveys and the logs, yeah. Um, yes. Yeah. So, right, we basically wanted to see how well the models aligned um, that we generated. And so what we found is the log data is much better for looking at detailed constraints. So basically, if I'm looking at software updating, um, so here's an example message that they might have seen about Adobe Reader. Uh, and then we would ask them, you know, how quickly do you think you would install the update, and we can match this to our log records. Okay, and so what we see is that we had a bunch of these different messages that were one-off variations from each other. In terms of things like what application it was, um, how costly was the update in like whether or not you have to restart the machine? Um, did it say that it was a security, was it a security only update or did it mention that you get some features? Uh, and then finally, how long was the message? And when you look at the, the survey data um, and the log data models, um, the survey data doesn't really do a very good job of matching to the log data on these detailed constraints. And the reason we think that is, is that when I'm reading this in a survey, uh, the fact that I might have to restart theoretically isn't really that salient to me. Um, same with like I might get features I don't want and so forth. On the other hand, um, we wanted to look at things like how risky do you think doing the update is? Like, do you think it's going to make your machine crash more, et cetera? Um, and that's actually pretty hard to measure in logs. So we can look at like number of system crashes before and after updates of the same type over some amount of years. We can look at application crashes, but that doesn't seem to 
to map perfectly to people's perception of like how risky it is to do this update. Uh, and similarly with looking at their like general tendency to update, I only have sort of so much data from these computer logs. I didn't have mobile phones in this. Um, and so the, the models we got based on asking these general questions seemed better from the survey data. And we were able to ask kind of more nuanced questions about perception of risk. Um, or perception of like what they usually do in the survey. So it seems to us if you're wanting to, to test message variations, you really should use um, log data or some sort of observational system. Um, but if you're wanting to ask about general constructs, then surveys uh, may even be better or give you a lot more resources. Or you may want to you know, be able to, to pop up surveys occasionally to your users whose logs you're tracking. Yeah. What, what was the, the log source? Uh, this was Symantec. Um, so they have uh, uh, Tudor Demetrius, who's a professor at Maryland, used to work at Symantec and made this big wine system. So why? Yeah. And it was all uh, uh, like Windows or iOS? Uh, these were all Windows, yes. And all the people we surveyed were also just Windows people. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah. You mentioned that the shopping spam was more sophisticated. Mm. Than, than some of the other types yeah. of spam. Um, is it a challenge going forward that over time spam is just going to get uh, yeah. better and better? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Right. So we have some suggestions for like, what do I do about shopping spam? But tomorrow won't be shopping spam, it'll be something else. Yeah. This was part of. Um, why I had the suggestion to them around like click through rates and also separating out um, classifiers by topic because at the time it was just sort of like all spam is spam and it's pretty clear from these results that that's not true um, and so I think we need to do better f like tracking almost of like what are the rising trends like I think about this a bit like marketing right in that you know, marketing agencies are going to track what are the best ads right now and what are the things about these ads that are especially effective and they're going to try to like replicate that. In spam, we don't necessarily think of it that way, but that's what the spammer is doing. And so I think looking at click through rate and also even like features of what, like what's the call to action in the spam that's working really well is something that would be helpful. Yeah. I exist via email too if you. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks.